crash course within a crash course on visual rhetoric, we've covered line, size, texture, and value, and last week we talked about what's in an image, content. But that's only part of the picture. How the content is arranged in an image is almost as important as what's in the picture in the first place. Today we're talking about the last element of visual rhetoric, composition. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. Now, at a later date, I'll probably talk more about the specifics of page layout and panel composition within comics, but today's video is about composition as it applies broadly across the visual arts. Composition, as I briefly mentioned, describes not what is in a picture, but how the content of a picture is organized in space. Composition can be tricky to wrap your head around if you're not familiar with visual arts, but luckily for us, the Scottish painter Marion Body Evans broke down composition into eight composite elements in a clear, concise post on her blog. You can find the link below in the notes for the episode. So as Body Evans says in her post, in Western art, composition is most commonly discussed in terms of balance, contrast, focus, motion, pattern, proportion, rhythm, and unity. If you didn't catch them all at once, we're going to go one by one. So the most obvious way to think of balance is in terms of symmetry. A symmetrical composition generally creates a sense of order and thereby calm. However, too much symmetry can seem too ordered and even unnatural. Asymmetry can feel unbalanced, but it's worth noticing that balance doesn't only come from symmetry. Some of the most balanced compositions are not symmetrical, but based on the rule of thirds. Images have a left, right, and center. They have a top, middle, and bottom and they have a foreground, midground, and background. Composing an image so that elements appear balanced in the different areas of these thirds doesn't necessarily result in symmetry, but it can result in a composition that feels balanced. Hiroshige's view of Mount Fuji at dawn near Hara is an interesting example of an asymmetrical but balanced composition. So due to the towering nature of Mount Fuji, the composition is heavily balanced toward the right side of the image. However, if we look at the rule of thirds, we can see this asymmetrical composition isn't so off-putting because while Mount Fuji overwhelms the right and center, the figures, who are, well, the focal point of the image in many ways, take up the left and center foreground. The cranes in the middle ground and the mountains in the far background also balance each other off. Thus, while the image isn't symmetrical, especially by any center point, it still maintains a sense of balance. And while I wouldn't call John Singer Sargent's El Haleo unbalanced, it seems to me he's playing with our sense of security on purpose. The dancer is haunting, intriguing, and ethereal. She seems to have possessed her audience. The stark shadow behind her, taking up nearly a third of the wall, the almost bleached white of her dress, right in the middle of the large splotch of shadows, the way the dancer appears to transform the line of black and white clad serious men into colorfully attired, wildly enthusiastic women. This image is defined not by balance, but by explosion, breakage, change, and motion. So balance isn't always what an artist is going to be going for. Next is contrast. We discussed contrast in visual rhetoric a few weeks ago, and I even mentioned that it was often a powerful tool for composition. The difference between dark and light tones, whether it's intense or subtle, plays a powerful role in how our eye moves across an image. High levels of contrast affect balance. Is one side of an image dark and another light? It also massively affects where we focus. Speaking of which, the third element of composition is focus. But here we're using the term in the sense of emphasis, not necessarily focus like a camera lens. How does the viewer's eye move across an image? Where does the eye land first? Where does it end? How long does it stop on particular elements? Using elements of visual rhetoric broadly and the elements of composition specifically, skilled artists can do a lot to manipulate a viewer's focus. So speaking of the moving eye, movement is a massively important part of composition. Some images seem to want to arrest you, to make you focus on a specific element and stay put. Others seem to encourage you to move your eyes all around an image. Colors and shapes can do a lot toward encouraging movement, but so can gestures and directions of subjects in the image itself. For example, if the people in an image are looking or pointing at a particular direction, chances are you're going to look in that direction too, whether you want to keep your eyes put or not. 
Take, for example, the Oath of the Horati by Jacques-Louis uh, David. There are a ton of beautiful details in this image. I particularly think the sandaled feet are lovingly rendered. But it's hard to look at anything but the center of the image, considering the bright red tunic and all the hands pointing toward the shining swords. You can try to look away, but everything in the painting points you right back to the middle. Proportion has to do with how things relate to each other, especially in size. Now, in realistic images, this matters a lot, as we discussed two episodes ago. In less realistic images, proportion can be used to emphasize emotional and visual importance as well. Pattern doesn't have to be a literal pattern, like polka dots or plaid. Perhaps motif or repetition is another way to think of this element of composition. To quote Bodhi Evans, if you look at fundamental lines and shapes, is there an underlying structure? Are there repeated shapes, symbols, and colors? Take Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with thorn necklace. Though the animals are all different, they make up one pattern, animals. Then there are two sort of sub-patterns. There are black animals, like the crow, the monkey, and the cat, and Frida's hair seems to join in this pattern. And white animals, the moth pins, and then the two flowers that look like moths join that pattern. And then there are the vein patterns, a pattern that is both literal in the leaves behind her and metaphorical or symbolic in the way that the thorns resemble veins and then those open the literal veins of her neck. So plenty of art uses literal patterns, but patterns like this also exist everywhere if you're willing to look. Now images might be silent, but they have rhythm. This is often related to the two previous elements I've mentioned, pattern and movement. Sometimes, as in this piece by Piet Mondrian, the idea of rhythm makes a lot of sense. I mean, the title alone suggests he's trying to evoke rhythm. But sometimes it might not. Does the Mona Lisa have rhythm? Maybe. Think about how your eye moves across an image, where it stops, how long it stops. Do you go back and forth? Do you move quickly or slowly across the image? Do you jump through some areas and linger on others? When you look at an image, try to find its beat. And finally, there's unity. Unity is kind of the combination of everything I've mentioned before. Does the image, page, sculpture, whatever, work together? Is something out of place, not working with the whole? Why would an artist strive for unity? Why might they go for disunity? Take this example. So see that weird blob? Now, if you look at this painting from the right angle, what you'll see is that weird blob is actually a skull. So this is what we call a memento mori. It was meant to remind the pious that everyone dies and therefore we should live life as though every moment is precious and that all decisions matter in regards to our eternal soul. The point is that it breaks up the unity of the image. On purpose, the point of the memento mori is to be a surprise reminder that death is always around the corner, like the grim reaper jumping out at you. So. Crash course on composition. What's in a picture matters, but how what's in a picture is put there matters just as much. So next week we're gonna begin to crack the code on comics, but with one foot still in the art theory world. I'll be talking about Scott McCloud's big triangle and thinking about the purpose of different styles of art and particularly why comics tend to use a pretty slim slice of the spectrum. See you then.